Good morning. Today we will be continuing from what we did last week, dimensions of vector spaces and subspaces and uh, bases. Today we will be talking about change of bases and then move on to something called orthogonality, which we have seen in different contexts right from the beginning actually. And lastly, there will be another algorithm called the uh, Gram-Schmidt process, which is for orthogonalization of a matrix. And that will lead to one more decomposition. And decomposition basically means writing a matrix as a product of two other matrices. Learning objectives for today. We will be looking at uh, basis changes and how can we tell whether a matrix is orthogonal or two vectors are orthogonal to each other. Describe and perform gram schmidt We have a special kind of matrix, a full rank square matrix. You can make it orthogonal or you can get an orthogonal ver version of it. And that algorithm is called gram schmidt process and we'll look at that. So let's recap basis and components once more. Basis, as you know, the minimal set of vectors to span that space, which will mean that the basis vectors are linearly independent. Otherwise, it won't be a minimal set. The moment you have a basis, any vector in that space can be expressed as a linear combination of these vectors in the basis set. That's the reason why these things are called the basis. In Rn, if you have n components for all the vectors in Rn, then you need n basis vectors too. If ai, ith column of matrix A is a basis vector, then you will need n of them. So once you have a basis, a vector is a unique linear combination of the basis vectors that we saw multiple times. Then let me introduce a new notation here for any vector in Rn. Suppose you have a basis of ai, which are columns of a matrix A, then you can write any vector in Rn as a linear combination of these columns, which means any vector x in Rn can be written as a linear combination of the columns of the matrix A, Ai. Those components, those uh, scaling factors are actually the components of the vector x in the basis of Ai. That's the definition of the components. If you can write a vector as the linear combination of a bunch of other vectors, and if the other vectors are actually a basis then the scaling factors of the, the basis vectors and that is called the component the coefficients that specify the linear combination are the components of the vector in that basis and that is this little notation that says xi bar a the component the ith component of x in the basis a now as you know a linear combination is unique which means the components of the vector are unique also which means if you have a vector in any space and you have you have specified the basis, a vector can be written only in one way, one unique linear combination. There are multiple ways of writing the same vector. But what will happen is that when you change the basis from one set to another set, you will get different components. That is something that we will see very soon. The best possible basis set that you can have is the identity matrix. So that is the second thing. If you have any vector at all, the moment I specify a vector, I'm already giving you the component. For instance, I specified a vector B, here this is my vector b and that already comes with a set of components what are those components what basis do those components refer to that is a fair question to ask it, the answer is that they are based on the identity matrix so i'll tell you why suppose i have a vector in r2 and i have two components two and three how can i even say that two and three are the components where do i get the numbers two and three from what i'm saying is that it actually comes from the identity matrix because i x in other words, multiplication with the identity matrix doesn't change the vector. So identity matrix in R2 by 2 is 1, 0, 0, 1. I multiply that with my original vector x. I should get the original vector back. But we can also look at this multiplication here as a linear combination of the columns of the identity matrix. First column 1, 0, second column 0, 1. That is the column picture of matrix multiplication. So it is 2 of the the first column plus three of the second column that's what it says now if you look at this guy one zero that is a vector that is a unit vector and it's got unit length because the component that it has is one and the other component is zero so the norm is a one and the second one also the norm is one and more than that if the take the dot product of those guys is one times zero plus zero times one that is zero so they are orthogonal to each other and they have unit length so that's the best possible basis that you can have we will call this guy say q1 and the second one q2 those are the unit vectors normalized and orthogonal vectors and in physics they are actually called i and j once you have this one here two times uh, q1 plus three times q2 that is a linear combination of q1 and q2 and that gives you the original vector two three and if you want you can specify 
that that vector is in the basis i in uh, 2 by 2 that is what the subscript means so 2 3 the components that i have for this vector actually come from the identity matrix and you can explicitly state it by putting that subscript i if you want but nobody does that so it's a perfect basis it's the best possible basis that you can have because the columns are unit vectors orthogonal to each other they're orthonormal so we can write that in one simple mathematical statement that says qi transpose qj that means qi dot qj is one when i is equal to j so qi transpose times qi so let's take the first one i is equal to one qi transpose which is one zero qi one zero also so one times one plus zero times zero qi transpose qi is one for i equal to one for i equal to one and j equal to two we saw that that is zero because it's one times zero plus zero times one and even if you have more number it's going to be the same idea so that is the orthogonality and normality conditions in just one statement so these vectors are actually more than orthogonal they are orthonormal they are orthogonal to each other and they are also normalized so the right word to use is orthonormal there is one interesting fact that the dimension of the space is the number of uh, basis vectors which is also the same as the trace of the matrix trace is uh, basically just a sum of the diagonal elements the trace of the identity matrix which is the basis of that space will actually be the dimension because each column has just one one in the diagonal element so just add up you'll get the number of uh, columns or number of rows same thing and that is the dimension people like to use the concept of trace because it's got interesting properties whenever they see trace anywhere they get excited and they use it okay so that is a uh, one very good uh, basis set that we saw and that basis set was actually orthonormal but it's not just the identity matrix that is uh, orthonormal you can have other matrices also if you have the same property if you have any two of them multiplying uh, first one transpose the second one is one when the numbers are the same the indices are the same and if they are zero when the indices are different then they are orthonormal orthogonality orthonormality implies some interesting properties it basically means that taking the inverse it's just transposing the matrix q1 q2 qn standing in uh, columns that is my q matrix my q transpose in rows and if i take the product let's take the product q transpose q suppose i write this as a uh, in element form ij that is the element that's not a vector qij is actually as an element is actually qi transpose as a vector and qj that comes from the the dot product version of a matrix multiplication but that is actually true is the ith row of the first matrix dotted with the jth column of the second matrix and we know that this is equal to one is equal to one if uh, i is equal to j and equal to zero when i is not equal to j so that means it's an identity matrix and that is true only if this is equal to one if it is just orthogonal and not orthonormal then the dot product will not be equal to one when the indices are the same because the norm is not uh, not one okay so that's why this applies only to orthonormal not orthogonal but like i said people use orthogonal to mean orthonormal so when they say orthogonal most of the time they actually mean orthonormal people use orthogonal to mean orthonormal so you will see the statement the test for orth orthogonality of a matrix is this and i might also use it even though i am a bit of an ocd guy and I like to use orthonormal, but I might slip into using orthogonal now and then because it is very widely used. So that's why Q, Q transpose or Q transpose Q is I. And that gives you test for orthonormality. Okay. An orthonormal matrix preserves the norm. That is a second statement. So that also you can see what's the norm of uh, Q times X. So basically Q is a matrix and X is a vector. So Q times X is a vector and Q is a, is a square matrix n by n n is the same as the number of elements of x so it's kind of transforming the vector into a different vector in the same space so it's giving you it's taking x and giving you another vector in the same space and the norm of that vector is the same as the original vector that is what i'm saying here so let's see why the norm of qx is the same as norm of x that's what we need to prove so norm of uh, qx is the dot product of qx with itself so that is a uh, qx transpose qx and you can apply the the product rule of uh, transposes so this guy becomes the in becomes the product of the transposes but in the opposite uh, order reverse order so x transpose q, t q transpose and then on the other side you have q and uh, x and you can think of q transpose q which is equal to i from here so you put i there then that becomes x transpose x which is a square of uh, 
a norm of x. So the square of a qx norm is the same as the square of norm x. And as you know, norm is a positive, is a length, is a positive number. So you worry only about the positive square root. So you can say that uh, the norm of uh, qx is the same as the norm of x. Then the other thing is orthonormal matrices all have unit determinants. By unit, I mean plus or minus one. So if we take the determinant, the you know that the inverse is the same as the transpose. So the determinant of the inverse is the same as the determinant of the transpose. But from the properties of determinant, you know that the transpose of a matrix will have the same determinant as the original one. And the inverse of a matrix will have the reciprocal of the determinant. So this guy gives you 1 over determinant of uh, Q. And this guy gives you just determinant of Q. What does that mean? It means determinant of Q squared is equal to 1. That means determinant of Q is 1. So these are proofs using matrix algebra rather than element wise multiplication. Or so the last two proofs are elegant because they're using matrix algebra. And that's the kind of proof I would like to see because even though they might look trivial, they are real proofs. And uh, the reason why the proofs work is because there is this whole machinery of linear algebra that we built up, the syntactical engine of linear algebra that we built up standing behind, behind these, uh, these little elegant expressions there. All right. Let's move on to change of basis. Let me give you a, a kind of a motivation why we might want to do change of basis. It is used in uh, in gaming, computer games, in multiplayer games, if you have the world seen from your perspective as you're playing it and you have somebody else playing and the same world, same three-dimensional world that is in the computer memory is viewed from a different perspective from somebody else's uh, perspective. And this change is actually a change of basis. It's actually more complicated than a change of basis, but let's say that fundamentally it's actually a change of basis. So it is used in that context. So how you compute that is what you had to figure out. So in order to do this, you have a vector typically given in the identity basis, the coordinate basis. Identity basis is, and it's also called the, the coordinate basis. So suppose I give you a vector, say two, three in two dimensions, and that is in the identity basis. If I don't say anything, that is in the identity basis. And I give you a bunch of basis vectors. Those vectors are also in the identity basis. So you can put them in a matrix and that matrix then is in the identity basis. Then what I have is that uh, the new components of the vector based on the matrix of the basis vectors that I specify, the vectors are AI standing in as column vectors in A, then that multiplying the linear combination is the same as the original vector. So that is a condition. So you have one vector, you have the components and you have a new set of components and new set of basis vectors and the linear combinations of the new basis uh, vectors with the components should give you the same vector. That's why it's the components of the same vector. But if you just look at it, if you look at uh, the equation, x is equal to a times a bunch of numbers that we call x sub a because those are components in the matrix, in the basis matrix of a. That is very similar to ax equal to b. In fact, it's identical. This is a, this is x, and that is b. So it's a x sub a is equal to x. And all you have to do to get x sub a, the components in the new basis, is just a inverse times x. Since a is a basis matrix, it's a full rank invertible matrix in the case of uh, vector spaces. Basis for vector spaces is a full rank and invertible matrix. So I can always take the inverse and just multiply. So it's actually a fairly simple thing to do. In fact, it's the same as solving the set of linear equations. a x sub a is equal to x is a bunch of linear equations because I know x as numbers. I know a as a table of numbers and x sub a, those are the only unknowns. So I just solve the set of equations. One way of solving is just multiplying by the inverse on both sides. Okay, anyway, we'll do a couple of examples, then it'll become even clearer. So what I want to do is to say that q x norm is equal to the norm of x. This is what I want to do, right? So instead of doing the norm, I can try proving that it's a square of the norm that is uh, the same. And what's the definition of uh, the norm squares? Y transpose Y is the, the square of the norm of Y. So I can use that on the left-hand side and right-hand side. Then I can write Q X transpose Q X, that is the left-hand side is equal to X transpose X on the right-hand side. And this is a product transposed. And then I can use the product rule of our transposes that basically says it's the product of the transposes, but in the reverse order, Q X is equal to X transpose X. Now this guy 
is i so that just drops off then on the left hand side i have x transpose x and the right hand side also is x transpose x so this is actually true okay so basis change is basically the same as solving a system of linear equations and um, a myriad of ways in which you can do that one of them is just multiplying by the inverse which is what we will use in the example but you can do this using gaussian elimination or gaussian elimination so change of basis let's take an example in the coordinate basis i have a vector the green vector x that reads 7 5 so that means my unit vectors q1 is 1 0 and q2 is a 0 1 the column vectors of uh, the identity matrix and i need to take 7 of q1 to reach here then you add 5 of q2 to reach here and that those are my components so it's uh, basically just says x is 7 times q1 plus 5 times q2 so the components of x in the basis identity basis or the coordinate basis same thing is 7 5 that's what we started from now suppose i change the basis to a different set of vectors a1 prime and a2 prime i have 3.5 and 2.5 what do you think the components of x are in this basis how many a1 prime do i need to get to the tip of x and how many a2 prime do i need to get to the tip of x it's 2 and 2 so it's basically 2 times a1 prime plus 2 times a2 prime which means in that basis the prime basis a prime basis the components now are 2 and 2 now let's take a complicated one this was easy because uh, a1 prime was a scale version of a1 and a2 prime was a scale version of q2 scale versions of the unit vectors now a1 double prime is 2 1 a2 double prime is 1 1 so some vectors so it's a1 double prime is a 2 2 a2 double prime is a 1 1 so these are the vectors here and i have to express x as a linear combination of these two which is possible because clearly a1 double prime is not a, not linearly dependent on a2 double prime how do i know that these two vectors the double prime vectors are not linearly dependent on each other they're not collinear they're not on top of each other so there will be some unique linear combination that will actually give me that let's try to find it so i'm saying that what i'll do is i'll just look at the lines there i'll see that if i take two a1 double prime then add a2 double prime three of them then i'll get to the tip of x so just by looking at that i can say that uh, the linear combination that i need is 2 and 3 so x in the basis of a double prime a matrix that contains a1 double prime and a2 double prime as columns is actually 3 2 so let me summarize this my original matrix a which was the identity matrix that was my original basis matrix 1 0 0 1 my q1 was the first column 1 0 q2 0 1 and my vector was a linear combination taking 7 of uh, q1 5 of q2 so i get the vector components 7 and 5 now i took a different basis of uh, matrix a prime 3.50 0, 0 2.5 then we saw that you need a 2 of a, a1 prime and a 2 of a2 prime so the components are 2 and 2 and the third case i had a more complicated not orthogonal this time i have a1 double prime 2 1 a2 double prime 1 1 and we saw that this is the right linear combination that i needed and th that is unique every linear combination is unique so that actually corresponds to situation where you have a unique set of solutions which is true when you have a, a full rank square matrix so we saw that the components were three and two now how do i get this now one thing you might want to notice is that uh, when going from q1 to a1 prime the size of the the vector increased i'm scaling it up and this the size of the component actually decreased so you can kind of see that there is some kind of reciprocal or inverse coming in somewhere which is what we saw so there is a reciprocal or inverse coming in let's try to do the third one once more but i'll drop the double prime uh, superscript so that it's easier to write so what we have the formula for change of basis is that the linear combinations of the columns of a with the new components in the new basis should give me the original vector which means the components in the new basis are equal to the inverse of the basis matrix times original vector these are just numbers that we know a is a table of numbers that we know because those are columns which are basis vectors which are specified so those are numbers also we know and then we can compute this and x sub a components of x in the basis of a those are the only unknowns we can solve x is specified in the in the coordinate basis 7 5 you don't even have to say i and the basis matrix a also is specified in the identity 
basis because 2 1 the first basis vector was in the identity basis second one also is in the identity basis now my statement was that the new set of components will come from the inverse times so I just have to find the inverse of this guy and multiply this on the right that's all I need to do so how do I find the the inverse what's the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix swap diagonals so in the place of 2 I get the other one 1 so 2 and 1 they just get swapped and off diagonals I just uh, switch the sign and then I have to divide by the determinant of a happily for us what's the determinant of a it is 2 times 1 minus 1 times 1 so it is 1 that has the inverse and the new basis is just the inverse times the original uh, components and if you do the multiplication I get 7 times 1 minus uh, 1 times 5 that is 2 minus 7 plus 10 that is 3 so you get the components which is what we started from okay now what I have are two linearly independent vectors in R3 their span is a is a 2d subspace it's a plane going through the origin in three dimensions in R3 so the vectors that I start from a1 the first two components are the same as what we had but I added a new purple component one just for the heck of it and a2 is a 1 1 0 so these are two vectors in R3 they will sign a subspace and that is going to be a two-dimensional subspace it's going to be a plane so if I arrange them in a matrix A I have 2 1 1 2 1 1 and 1 1 0 so this is the basis matrix it's not a square matrix now because I have only two basis vectors because my subspace has dimension 2 in R3 now I'm constructing a new vector X by taking 2 of A1 and 3 of A2 so I know that the components will have to be 2 and 3 I'm actually doing this by construction so three, 2 times a1 and 3 times a2 so if I do that 2 times a1 4 2 2 and 3 times a2 3 3 so 4 plus 3 7 2 plus 3 5 and 2 plus 0 2 so those are the components that's my vector x now what are my components in the basis for the subspace to begin with how, how many components will be there I have only two basis vectors because it's a subspace and I have to scale I have to find the right linear combination of these two vectors so there are only two scalar multiples to that so there are only two two uh, components so even though my vector that I'm starting from is a three component vector the components in the new basis are going to be only two of them in number so that is something that you have to understand that is because the subspace is defined by two basis vectors not three so I'll get only two components that's enough so if I take two of the first vector and three of the second vector I uniquely get my x the original vector and that's all I need so that is an important point to remember even though the x that you're starting from has three components as a member of the subspace I need only two numbers to specify it and if it was actually a subspace that is a line then there's only one vector in the line specifying the subspace I need to specify only how much I need to scale that vector by there's only one number that I need to specify in that case this is a two-dimensional subspace so I need two numbers so this is important so let's try to compute the components in the subspace so we'll start from the same set of equations this still holds some linear combination of the lean columns of A will give me the original x vector so I should have been able to write this way but A now is not a square matrix so I cannot really talk about A inverse so that doesn't work so that's why that is grayed out so A is a tall matrix and but it's always full rank tall matrix all the columns are linearly independent how do I know that the columns of A are linearly independent the columns of A are the basis vectors and basis ve vectors are supposed to be linearly independent so the columns are linearly independent so it's a full column rank matrix it's a tall full rank matrix so it has a left inverse so I can find a matrix multiplying on the left that will give me the identity matrix if I can find it if I know how to find it then I can multiply this equation here on both sides with a inverse left so both sides okay so then I'll get the components of x in the basis of a as a inverse left times x so the only question is can I find a inverse left just to recap how we found the left inverse that comes from the fact that a transpose a is a full rank ma matrix because a is a full column rank full rank a transpose is full row rank and a transpose a will have the number of columns and number of rows equal to n which is the number of columns of a I have a in uh, r m n m greater than n m is 3 n is 2 a transpose is going to be in uh, r n times m 
So A transpose A, A transpose A, so you'll get rid of these guys, and this is going to be in R N N, and that's a smaller matrix. N is a smaller than M, so this is R two two. This is a two by two matrix, and the rank two columns are linearly independent, so the rank is actually two. So this is a full rank matrix. A transpose A is a full rank matrix. It's, a, it's got the same rank, and it has an inverse. So the moment I have an inverse, I can write the inverse condition so that the inverse of a transpose a multiplying a transpose a either on the left or right should give me i now i choose to multiply on the left so that i can extract the green part of it that looks like something multiplying a on the left giving me i so that is the left inverse so i wrote it down this way so that it is probably kind of hard to memorize that left inverse is this right inverse is that etc but if you know where it comes from you can immediately write this guy. This is very easy to remember. This is always true. And then you can actually kind of derive left inverse in about 10 seconds. So this is the way I would remember it. Now let's actually do this computation. So I have A1 and A2 there and my A matrix there, 2, 1, 1, which is A1, 1, 1, 0, which is A2. And my linear combination that I built by hand, 2 of A1, 2 of A1 and 3 of A2. Okay, so this was built by hand, 2 of A1 and 3 of A2. Now I want to compute the components and for that I will compute the left inverse. So I'll compute A transpose then multiply by A take its inverse and then multiply that by A transpose. Tedious computation. I cannot get this right in a million years if I try to do this uh, by hand. So I just did it in uh, Sage Math. So it gave me the answer. That's the answer and that is correct. The left inverse times the original vector x will give me the components that turns out to be 2, 3. This is uh, 7 over 3 minus 5 over 3, that is 2 over 3, plus 2 times 2 over 3, that is 4 over 3, so 2 plus 4, 6 over 3, that is 2, so you get that. The second one, 0 times 7, plus uh, 5 times 1, minus 2 times 1, so that is uh, 5 minus 2, that is 3, so you get that. We started with 2a1 plus 3a2, and we retrieved it using our left inverse, so that method actually works. So we move on to this concept of orthogonality. In fact, it's not a new concept. We saw this a couple of times already. We even defined the orthogonality of subspaces, etc. Now, our idea is to actually move on to the concept of orthogonality of uh, matrices. But orthogonality of vectors on which everything else is based is basically perpendicularity. But I should be careful or we should be careful when thinking about vectors in coordinate spaces like line segments with arrows at the tip because there are vectors that are not like that in abstract vector spaces where you have functions or uh, or other entities that are vectors you may not be able to talk about perpendicularity but this definition that the inner product of two vectors equal to zero will mean that they are orthogonal to each other we will use the term orthogonal rather than perpendicular because there may be strange vectors for which perpendicularity doesn't make any sense so there are different consequences to that the first one is of course that the inner product or the dot product is zero and the second one is that the projection of one vector onto the other is zero if they are orthogonal to each other for our purposes let's think of them as perpendicular vectors and uh, but everything that we say here will apply to other kinds of vectors too so the projection of one vector to another is zero and orthogonal is basically the opposite of uh, scale vectors or collinear vectors or even parallel vectors parallel means in the normal sense the angle between two things is zero and uh, orthogonal means the angle between the two things is uh, pi over two all right so let's also define a norm this we again is something that we already did a norm is defined as the square root of uh, the sum of the squares of the components of the vector so if it's got m components then it's the sum like that x1 square plus x2 square up to x m square the whole thing square rooted so as you can see this is the same as the dot product of the vector with itself square rooted that sum product is actually the dot product and that is a square of the norm now if you scale the norm scale a vector by a number and take the norm of the scaled vector then the norm gets scaled by the absolute value of the scalar so if you take negative of a vector and find its norm it's the same as the norm of the original vector norm being the length it doesn't have a sign it's always positive which is why you have to have this absolute value here for the scalar so this is the normal normal definition of norm normal norm it's called the euclidean norm now let's look at the fact that uh, the norm has to scale 
with a, with scalar multiplication in absolute value. So the statement that we saw in the previous slide was not an accident. It's actually baked into the notion that uh, the norm is actually the length or the size of the vector. In addition to the Euclidean norm that we defined there, we can define a general p norm where p is any number greater than or equal to 1, the real number, and it's defined as p norm of x is uh, the first component absolute value to the power p, second component to the power p, etc., up to all components raised to the power p, summed up, and then taken the pth root, which is 1 over p, raised to the power 1 over p. So that is the definition of p norm. Again, you can see that if you scale this by s, p norm will have to scale by the absolute value of s because s will go inside here, it will scale each component and you get the absolute value of s going into each one of these terms here and absolute value of s to the power p can be taken out and then you take the pth root and then now there are special cases this again is something that we discussed earlier we have manhattan distance which is a taxi cab distance and the normal case the two norm p equal to two that is a euclidean distance or euclidean norm so in this current example and in this course in general we will be working with uh, the two norm euclidean norm and a large number of machine learning algorithms or pattern recognition or pattern detection algorithms like k-means clustering for instance uses the euclidean distance by default but they can use other distances too and there have been uh, some studies where i saw that euclidean euclidean distance has a problem with its sensitivity to outliers because it comes in as a square of the distance and the square gets very big when you have an outlier for that reason some people prefer to use uh, one norm and that turns out to be more robust against outliers so there have been studies like that okay so this is all all there in computer science so even though euclidean distance is the normal natural distance that we think of there are other distances also that are possible that you might be able to use in uh, in uh, data science applications now test for orthogonality if it is two vectors we are talking about vectors being orthogonal it's just the dot product has to be equal to zero why this is true this is actually not a definition per se it is actually a consequence we can actually prove it consequence means it's something that you can prove from more fundamental or foundational principles more axioms so first of all by definition we know that a dot b is a scalar so a transpose b being a sum product of a bunch of numbers is a scalar and by definition of a scalar a transpose of a scalar is itself scalar is a one by one matrix it's a symmetric matrix so take the transpose of it it doesn't change so we can say that a transpose b is equal to a transpose b the whole thing transpose which turns out to be b transpose a so that's the first piece so let's take two vectors a and b a is my red vector and b is my blue vector so that is red that is blue orthogonal to each other which means 90 degrees in a normal coordinate picture and if i move the second vector to the tip of the first vector i can look at the sum of the two vectors running from the the beginning of the first vector to the tip of the second vector that is my sum and if a is orthogonal to b a b and the sum will form a right angle triangle with the sum being the the hypotenuse so we have the the famous uh, pythagoras theorem which states that uh, the size of uh, a which is the the red vector squared plus the size of uh, b squared is equal to the size of the hypotenuse squared so we just write we know that the size is actually the norm so we write a norm squared b norm squared is equal to the norm of a plus b squared and we know the definition of the square of the norm as uh, a transpose a for a b transpose b for b and a plus b transpose a plus b for a plus b the norm square so you can write that way and then by the property that uh, the transpose of a sum is the sum of transposes we can write the last statement here now this is a product which you can expand making sure that we don't shuffle the uh, the order because it's not commutative in any case we can take the side multiply by a a transpose a b transpose a as a second term then b a transpose b a transpose b then b transpose b so we get the four terms there by just distributing the multiplication and taking making sure that the order remains the same and as you can see the red ones this guy and this guy are the same and the blue ones they appear on the left hand side and the right hand side so they get cancelled off and what you get is that a transpose b plus b transpose a is equal to zero but we proved by the product rule up here 
that A transpose B is the same as B transpose A. So each of them will have to be zero because they are the same. So that's how you kind of prove that uh, if the vectors are perpendicular to each other, then they are their dot product is uh, zero. This proof is not highly satisfactory in my book because we still use the angle and we still use the, the Pythagoras theorem. And uh, so this is not very satisfactory from a linear algebra perspective because we didn't use a generalized vector and just the definition of dot product. At least in the case of normal vectors in normal coordinate spaces, this is true. So here is an example of it. I take a vector, 5, 1, red vector, and uh, my blue vector, minus 1, 5, divided by 2, and they are perpendicular to each other. Then I can move B to the tip of A and find the sum there. That turns out to be 9, 7, the whole thing divided by 2, just the summation. 10 minus 1, 2 plus 5, so 9 and 7, and the half that is outside scaling both. I use the scalar because I wanted to keep everything within this picture. Okay, so if you look at the norm of uh, A, that is just uh, 5 square plus 1 square, square rooted, so that is square root of 26. Similarly, the norm of B will be half that much, and A square plus B square turns out to be. Uh, if you just add those two guys, you will get uh, 65 over 2, okay? A squared plus B squared, the norm squares. And similarly, if you take A plus B, the whole thing squared, again, you will get six, 65 by 2, obviously. This is a verification of Pythagoras theorem, which you might have done in uh, maybe in kindergarten, right? And if you take the dot product, which you might have done in uh, primary school, which turns out to be 0. So, which is uh, minus 1 times 10 plus 5 times 2, so minus 10 plus 10, so that is 0 divided by half times, uh, well, multiplied by half times half, so that is zero. Just an example, no big deal. Okay, are we okay so far? Are we okay with the proof and the example? Okay, good. Moving on to projection of vectors. Suppose I have two vectors, some general vectors, not specifying any space or anything, just two general vectors, a1 and a2. They have an angle of uh, theta between them. What's the projection of a2 onto a1? What's the projection of a2 onto a1 that's what i want to do and i will use the dot product using angles again not very satisfactory from the linear algebra perspective we'll do this better uh, next week i think or the week after that yeah the week after that two weeks after the recess we'll do this uh, better okay now if you think of uh, the dot product in terms of the the cosine of the angle then a transpose a or a1 transpose a2 is the norm of a1 times norm of a2 my red and blue vectors times the, the cosine of the angle between them. So we can find the cosine of the angle between them in terms of the dot product and the norms. So I have that. Then if I want to know the projection, what I would do is to construct this right angle triangle because projection is like shining light onto my vector A2 perpendicular. The direction of the light is perpendicular to A1 because I'm projecting onto A1 and I'm looking at the shadow cast by a2. That's what I want to find. That is the definition or the mental picture of the projection. So the length of that uh, projection is x. x, as you know from this right angle triangle, this guy is uh, 90 degrees. So the blue one becomes a hypotenuse and adjacent side is x. So hypotenuse times the cosine of uh, the angle between them. That gives you your uh, uh, adjacent side. So you get that. And from what I know as a cosine, I get a1 transpose A2 divided by the norm of A1 because A2 comes in the numerator there. Okay, that is my x. Now, for my purposes, it's not just the length of the projection that I want. I want, an, uh, want a vector that is collinear with A1. In other words, I want to find the unit vector, okay, that is scaled by x1. So I want to find the unit vector, which is A1 divided by the norm of A1. That will be the unit vector that will have a, the length of uh, 1 along the direction of a1 later we will call this q1 this unit vector multiplying x the length that will give me my projection vector so that vector i'll call a2 parallel because it's coming from a2 but parallel to a1 a2 parallel that is if i just do this i get a1 divided by norm of a1 a1 transpose a2 divided by the norm of a1 coming from here and then in the the denominator i have a1 norm of a1 square which is a1 transpose a1 and the numerator I have a1 times a1 times a1 transpose. So that is a kind of a nice little symmetry to this one. So a1 
a1 transpose divided by a1 transpose a1 so that we have to take a look at so that red guy the red fraction there multiplying any vector a2 will give me the parallel part of that a2 onto a1 so let's actually write it down here in my whiteboard and then look at it uh, in some detail so what did we have we have i'm going to just use a rather than uh, a1 so that it's easier to write down a a transpose divided by a transpose a okay that multiplying by multiplying any vector a2 will give me my projection a2 parallel i wrote this as a2 parallel a2 parallel this is what i'll get so let's just worry about the red part just let's worry about this this part now let's say that we're working in r3 and a is a vector of three dimensions so a is something like x y z that's what i'm working with so what's a transpose a transpose is going to be x y z but horizontal in a row if i multiply a transpose a then you know that you're going to get a scalar is the square of the norm of uh, a but if i multiply a transpose on the right with a what are you going to get and what you're going to get is uh, x y z x y z what's the shape of this beast this is going to be in r what what's the shape of this guy r3 would mean that it's a vector is it a vector that i'm going to get if i do this multiplication it's a three by three matrix it's going to be a three by three matrix because this guy is a three by one and that guy is one by three so this and this will kind of cancel off and then we will get a three by three matrix that's what i will catch so it's a matrix now this multiplication think of the row picture of multiplication this is a, a matrix here being multiplied on the right by some other matrix so it's a row of uh, numbers there being multiplied by some other number by the row picture i know that the rows of the product let me call this product just for the heck of it p the rows of p are going to be linear combinations linear combinations of the rows of the second matrix but there's only one of them there's only one the linear combinations of uh, a transpose that is what you have there and the second one also is a linear combination of a transpose third one also is another linear combination of a transpose in fact the first one the linear combination is just x times that and the second one is y that the third one is z times that now if i have three rows that are all linear combinations of each other what's the rank of p p remember is my a a transpose what's the rank of a a transpose if i have the three rows that are linear combinations of each other there's only one independent row other two are linear combinations or linearly dependent on the other row the first row so the rank is only one so this is a rank one matrix this is a rank one matrix rank one matrix obviously this is not going to be invertible because rank deficient is singular so all kinds of bad things but it's a rank one matrix so it's something to keep in mind okay now we wrote down the the rank one matrix corresponding to a1 and if i want to find the projection vector of a1 onto a2 all i have to do is to just change the digit 1 to 2 and 2 back to 1 so i'll get this so that is just uh, just symmetry of the 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 formula so you can actually compute a2 transpose or a1 tra uh, a2 parallel or a a1 parallel depending on which way you want to do this so that is all about projection of uh, vectors projection of one vector onto another using the cosine of the angle between them now moving on to the other part when you project a vector onto another vector what you're getting is a parallel part that's why we call it a2 parallel but what about the perpendicular part how do you get the perpendicular part so let's take a look at that one so what we did was to compute a2 parallel and we had a nice little formula for that which was essentially this a1 a1 transpose uh a1 transpose a1 that that is a square of the norm but i'm rewriting it as the original form because for my purpose coming up soon this is the way i would like it okay so a1 divided by the norm of a1 is a unit vector along the direction of a1 that is what i will call q1 and a1 transpose divided by norm of a1 is q1 transpose okay and now if you look at this part this is q1 dot a2 it's the dot product of q1 and uh, a2 which is the same as the dot product of a2 and q1 so i can actually write it this way because that is just a number i can take the transpose and you will get this one so i can write q1 and a2 transpose q1 now remember this is just a number the whole thing here is a number so it's just a number so i can actually move it anywhere i want so i'm i am planning to move it to the beginning 
So I'll write it this way, A2 transpose Q1, the whole thing being a number scalar, times Q1 is my parallel vector. This makes sense. What it is basically saying is that my parallel vector, A2 parallel, is in the direction of A1 because Q1 is in the direction of A1. Q1 is actually the specification of the direction of A1. And it's scaled by some number, which is actually the projection of uh, A2 onto Q1. The projection of A2 onto Q1. That is a dot product because Q1 has unit uh, unit length. So that's what it's saying. So it makes sense. Okay. So Q1 is a unit vector specifying the direction of A1. So this is the parallel part that we got. So I just rewrote it in a form that will be convenient to me later on. But it's still the same thing as we did in the previous slide. But what I want is actually the perpendicular part, the what is left of A2. How do I get that? Watch carefully because uh, it's got a nice animation here. What I will do is just subtract away the parallel part and then I'll get whatever is left which is the perpendicular part. So I'll move this guy over to the tip then I'll invert it and then add. So if I add the negative of A2 parallel which means I subtract A2 parallel from A2 what I what is left is the perpendicular part as you can see from this uh, vector addition kind of our diagram you can see I get the perpendicular part. This angle here is 90 degrees. So that's how I get the perpendicular part. Now if you have a full rank square matrix, invertible matrix, you might want to create an orthogonalized version of it. Okay, and why would you want to do that? Well, what will happen is that all columns will turn out to be unit lengths, orthogonal to each other, and you can use it as a basis if, I, if you want to. But the real reason behind it is that uh, it leads to a decomposition of the original matrix. So any square invertible matrix, matrix can be written as QR, Q being one orthogonal matrix, R being another matrix with some properties, and that becomes the basis of some algorithms. So that is the real reason, but you might find mathematical reasons. Another thing about the orthogonal version of it, any Q, we saw that it preserves the, uh, the, the norm of a vector. So if you are using that in a computer science kind of a application a program suppose you have some vector x and you're multiplying it by q say so let's say it's vector x0 this gives you x1 and then you multiply by q again to get x2 this kind of iterative uh, thing might come up in computer computer science in programs and you might have something like uh, xn giving you xn plus 1 q which basically say saying that q to the power n times uh, x0 or maybe n plus 1 is equal to x n plus 1 something like that so basically multiplying by a matrix a large number of times and if you know that the matrix that you're multiplying with is actually orthogonal then you know that the size of these uh, vectors x n plus 1 is going to be tractable it's not going to become too big overflow error or it's not going to become too small underflow error so you avoid some kind of uh, numerical problems by dealing with only orthogonal matrices that is nice that is a guarantee nice to have in writing programs okay otherwise you will have to handle those errors so what we will use is an algorithm called gram schmidt to get to a q matrix and then after that you'll get the r matrix also from starting from a, a square inver invertible matrix a the thing is it actually preserves the direction of the first vector the first column in a it is a column wise operation first column will be in the same direction the second column if the second column is to the right of the first column then in the in the q matrix also it will appear on the right of the the first column what i mean by that is this in order to go from the the uh, first vector to the second vector in some space you have to go in the clockwise direction that is what I mean by to the right of the first vector. In the Q matrix also in order to go from uh, the first vector to the second vector you will have to go in the clockwise direction. So that's all there is to it. So that just happens to be that way. I don't know if this has any kind of significance in terms of uh, applications but that it just happens that way. Okay so how shall we do this? So Gram-Schmidt process is an algorithm. So what you will do is take the first vector, normalize it. So you get a normalized version of the first vector. Then start from the the normalized version of the first one and get the part of the second vector, second column vector that is orthogonal to it, that is uh, perpendicular to the first one, which is the reason why we did this perpendicular part in the previous slide. Okay, And then normalize the perpendicular part that will become the second vector in uh, second column in Q. So you got Q1 and Q2. Then you will project 
the part of the third column in A to my Q1 and Q2 and get the perpendicular part and that will be perpendicular to the plane defined by Q1 and Q2. That becomes my third vector and then we'll normalize it and then we'll iterate it. Then we'll iterate until we run out of uh, out of uh, columns. So that's the plan. Okay. So let's see how this is done using my fancy animation again. Okay. So I have a matrix with A1, A2, A3 up to An in it and uh, N vectors. Just think of the first three of them in uh, multicolor here. A1 in red, A2 in uh, in blue and so i'm working in the plane of a1 and a2 so in other words i have rotated my my slide in such a way that it's actually lying on the plane of a1 and a2 but a3 is in some other direction it has to be it cannot be in the same plane as a1 and a2 can somebody tell me why is it that a a3 cannot be in the same plane as a1 and a2 anybody because they are they are meant to be linearly independent this matrix is supposed to be invertible so the columns are linearly independent it's a full rank matrix if they are on the same plane then it will mean that a3 is a linear combination of a1 and a2 which is not allowed okay so a3 is maybe it is sticking out of this plane towards me towards my nose so that's the picture picture you have to keep it keep keep in mind so the first step is to normalize a1 as uh, some normal some unit vector q1 in some direction but in the direction of a1 okay now what i do is find the perpendicular part of a2 for which i compute the parallel part first and subtract it away and then i get the perpendicular part okay this we saw and then i normalize that to get my second vector in my q matrix second vector so i have two columns already then i use those two columns project a3 onto these two and add them up what i will get is the projection of uh, a3 onto the plane of q1 and q2 i'm shining light kind of perpendicular to the slide and i'm getting the the shadow of uh, A3 onto the plane of uh, Q1 and Q2 and then I subtract that away from uh, A3 then I'll get the perpendicular part then I go and normalize that so I get the third vector so I get Q1, Q2 and Q3 then I keep iterating the same procedure until I get up to Qn or, or my vectors this, this is the Schmidt process that's it okay it's an iterative process quite nicely done okay so I got I started from A I got Q I can guarantee that it is uh, orthonormal because by construction I took I made sure that each uh, each column is orthogonal to all of the columns and I also made sure that each column is uh, normalized so it is orthonormal and if you think about it what we did was take the first column and normalize it so it's a column operation that we performed remember for raw operations that we performed in uh, elementary raw operations in uh, Gaussian elimination we had to multiply on the right by an elementary matrix because you are working with rows there's a row picture of a matrix multiplication here it becomes the column operation so it's a column picture the first step of a is to make a1 a unit vector so i'm dividing by the norm of uh, a1 so i take some product on the left so it's a linear combination of columns of a in such a way that the first column gets scaled down by by the norm of that column so the first element of x is going to be 1 over norm of a1 a1 okay so i take the first column of a and scale it by that one and i take none of uh, the rest of the columns so all other columns are going to be zero so that's the only thing i'm doing okay for the first column of column of q so a is going to q a is going to q so first operation is that when it comes to the the second column what i'm doing is taking the first one so there's some operation I'm going to do with the first one and then taking some part of the second one and subtracting away from the first one. So I'll have some element here. Let me call it uh, x12 and some element here x22. But I won't have any anything coming from any other rows, any other columns. I'll mess in with only the first two columns. I'm working with uh, the first column for the first column of Q, uh, first and second column for the second column of Q and so on. So it's going to be an upper triangular matrix. It's going to be an upper triangular matrix. It's going to be zero down here and potentially non-zero up here. So it's going to be X is going to be an upper triangular matrix. Okay. By just by the way, the sequence in which I'm applying the column operations. So it's a multiplication on the right and it's an upper triangular matrix because the first column Q1 of Q is a scale version of the first column of A1, first column of A, which is which we call A1. And the second column, q2 of q is a linear combination of the first two columns okay a1 and a2 so that's why 
it basically becomes an upper triangular matrix as, as we saw. Now, so A times some upper triangular matrix is going to give me Q. We don't know what the upper triangular matrix is. We are not actually keeping track of it. But we have some powerful tool here because we know that uh, Q is actually uh, orthonormal. So I will just write R as uh, the inverse of uh, inverse of this matrix that we don't know what this matrix is. That's why it's X. Okay. And then I can say that A is Q times R. A is Q times R. Again, we don't know what R is because we didn't keep track of the operations. We're not planning to keep track of the operations. But it is some matrix multiplying Q on the right hand side. What we know is, is that this inverse of uh, an upper triangular matrix is an upper triangular matrix. That we know. That is an exercise in the chapter actually. You will see the solution very soon, but it, it can be proven. It's tedious to do. You have to go through elements, etc. But uh, it can be proven. It is possible to do that. Okay. So I'm going to write A is equal to QR. Then I go back and say that R is actually equal to Q inverse times A. A is equal to QR. This I know it can be written that way. I don't know what R is yet. But I'm going to say that R is going to be equal to, I multiply both sides by Q inverse. So Q inverse A. Okay? So basically Q inverse A is equal to Q inverse Q R and this becomes the identity matrix and that goes away. So that's how I got the second one. Now what is Q inverse? I know that Q is guaranteed to be an orthonormal matrix. So that is this Q transpose A. Now transposing a matrix is very easy to do. We just take a matrix and then uh, flip the, the indexes indices so it's very easy to compute a you already have and just then it's just a matrix multiplication to get r okay so we don't really have to keep track of what we did in gram schmidt uh, process we can just get it from the final q easy to compute r is an upper triangular matrix also which you will try to prove during one week during the research week and then you will see my solution so inverse of an upper triangular matrix is an upper triangular matrix you can actually see why that is the case because if you take the inverse of the operation how you went from uh, a1 to q1 the opposite of that the inverse of that a q1 needs to be scaled up to get uh, a1 and then you have to take q1 and q2 to get uh, a2 and so on so it is uh, it is kind of obvious but hard to prove tedious to prove not hard but tedious to prove okay any questions so far i haven't shown you why this qr decomposition is important and where it is used but you will see at some point that this is actually useful actually you will have to wait quite a while before we actually come across an algorithm that uses this. All right, let me assume that there are no questions. So let's move on to what orthogonal matrices can do. One of the things that it can do is rotation. So orthogonal matrices do not change the norm of a vector. So the vector norm stays the same. So one thing it can do is probably reflect a vector. You take a vector and multiply by minus one. This goes in the opposite direction. The norm, the size is still the same. Or maybe rotate it through some angle. That also is possible. Or it can do something even naughtier, like shuffle the components. Remember, we had the, the permutation matrices. And if you remember single row permutations, they had the determinant equal to minus one. And the transpose of the matrix, which was actually the inverse, the inverse had to be the same because permuting two rows twice, you will get the original one back. So the inverse was the same matrix as itself and the matrix was actually symmetric. Permutation matrices of single row exchanges was actually symmetric. That's why Q transpose is actually equal to Q inverse in that case. Okay, so all those things actually work out nicely. Permutation matrices are orthogonal matrices. So rotation matrices are an interesting class of matrices, especially from the perspective of uh, physical sciences. Uh, it's actually very, very interesting for uh, for a physicist. Let me tell you why. I know that this is actually going slightly outside your uh, remit of uh, computer science, but since I like it, so I'm going to just tell you what it is. Okay. If you take a take a point in space and uh, in three dimensional normal space and rotate the the spatial axis, which is the same as rotating the matrix, uh, rotating the vector, the size of the vector doesn't change. Or if you take the distance between two points, the distance doesn't change. The distance is an invariant in uh, rotation because each the norm of the the norms of the vectors going to the the endpoints of the the two uh, two points between which you are computing the distance is uh, is invariant. The norms are invari invariant, so the the distance also is invariant, which is an interesting property, which is a property that is used in uh, in a lot of uh, uh, physics. So that is a normal three-dimensional space that we live in. 
it turns out that the space that we live in is not actually three dimensional it's actually four dimensional which is what einstein told us and the fourth dimension is actually time so there is a four four dimensional space called the minkowski space and there is a linear algebra there there is a there is a rotation there there's a rotation in four dimensional space and there is something that stays invariant there also and that invariance is called the lorentz invariance and uh, that is actually the space time distance between two events not two points but two two spatial points but two events two space spatial and uh, temporal points and that stays uh, constant and that constancy is the one that brings about all the weirdness of uh, of uh, special relativity like uh, like time dilation and twin paradox and uh, space uh, contraction all those things come about because of this lorentz invariance and the point is it, is it is a rotation it's actually an orthogonal matrix that does the rotation and because there is this whole machinery of linear algebra standing behind that formulation of uh, special relativity it is impossible to find a mathematical inconsistency in relativity once you once you assume that it is linear and that is why all these uh, thousands of scientists who did not like time dilation etc tried to prove that uh, it is not true they can't try to come up with experiments none of them work because it is linear algebra that is actually proving that nothing can work because linear algebra is true it is mathematics and for that reason these rotation matrices are quite nice and uh, quite interesting for physicists the reason uh, by the way i also believe that special relativity needs to be revised and the reason is not because of the mathematics but because of the assumption that it is linear the space time geometry is linear that is a problem that i believe is not true which is actually the basis of the book that you will get as uh, as a, the first prize of the quiz if you are actually into that kind of stuff okay maybe you are getting a bit more than you asked for but hey that's what it is all right coming back to a simpler situation in in a plane in a normal r2 plane you have only x and y in order to specify an angle in order to specify a rotation you need only one angle you don't need anything more than one angle so that rotation matrix you can maybe call it a q sub theta theta being the angle through which it rotates so only one angle needed in a r2 that is a that is true and it's kind of interesting and the inverse of that matrix is going to be inverse of that rotation matrix is going to be the same matrix where you replace theta by minus theta because whichever one you uh, whichever way you rotated the first time you want to do, undo it so rotate it in the opposite direction and it should actually give you the the opposite uh, operation which means it's the inverse of the matrix so we will see that in a second in r3 i still forgot to change this this is r3 not r2 in r3 in r3 you actually need let me write this in chinese which is easier to write you know on my computer in r3 something like that okay you need three angles to to specify a rotation because if you think of a plane going uh, flying in three dimensional space you have uh, what is it called it's called the pitch and uh, going from side to side is called the roll and going from uh, in the horizontal plane turning this way that is called the yaw so you need three angles those are the three angles you need to specify and there's a specific order in which you have to specify also so in r3 rotation is specified by three angles so just to keep in mind in r4 i don't know what it will be i think it is actually six angles but i don't really know okay but let's go back to r2 because it's a simpler situation look let's look at the rotation matrix so i have my q1 my first unit vector and in uh, in red and the second one in uh, blue and when i'm doing a rotation the tip of the the unit vectors are going to be on a unit circle in uh, rotation doesn't change the size of the vector an orthogonal matrix doesn't change the size of the vector so it's always going to be on a unit circle so the first rotation of the first uh, unit vector if you rotate it through an angle of theta then the coordinate of that will be the x coordinate is going to be cosine the y coordinate is going to be sine because uh, x coordinate is the adjacent side treating the unit vector as the as the uh, hypotenuse the rotator unit vector as the hypotenuse and then you get sine theta so that is q1 uh, q1 trans q1 uh, transformed q1 prime q2 prime is going to be minus sine theta cos theta and whatever my rotation matrix does to the two unit vectors it will do it to all of the vectors so my rotation matrix will just have q1 prime and q2 prime standing side by side so that's what the rotation matrix is is cos theta sin theta minus sin theta cos theta very famous uh, kind of uh, matrix this one 
although we will not really use this too much in uh, linear algebra for computer science linear algebra for other purposes this will come in uh, very useful so looking at it once more that is what it is cos theta sin theta minus sin theta cos theta rotation in the opposite direction i will just change the sine of theta everywhere so i'll get cosine of minus theta sine of minus, minus sine of minus theta and all that and you know the, the trigonometric formulas and basically you, what you will get is cos theta minus sine theta sine theta cos theta so that's what you will get and that is by definition because it's doing the opposite that's by definition the inverse of the matrix and if you look at it it's actually the transpose sine minus sine theta went to the place of uh, sine theta and uh, vice versa so it's just a transpose so inverse is actually the transpose now just for the heck of it let's do the inverse using the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix formula also swap the diagonal elements flip the sign of the non diagonal elements and divide by the determinant that's what we have to do the three steps i'm just doing it here so that you will remember this this is a mnemonic you have to remember this okay so swap the diagonal elements cos theta and cos theta swapping they will stay the same flip the sign of the non diagonal so sin theta becomes minus sin theta minus sin theta becomes sin theta and the determinant what's the determinant which is cos squared theta plus sin squared theta that is guaranteed to be one so determinant is one that is nice so the inverse turns out to be what you got here by replacing it by minus theta that's what i wanted to show you and it is actually the transpose also okay all good so everything works perfectly so let me summarize what we learned and then uh, do just have enough time to do the quiz so we talked about basis changes basis changes uh, when you have the components given to you for a vector as a column vector those components actually come from the identity ma identity matrix called the identity basis or the coordinate basis if you have any other basis which will mean a full set of orthogonal vectors which means a square matrix full rank matrix for the for a uh, vector space you will you can do the basis transformation we saw how to do that it's basically same as solving a set of linear equations really when you change the basis to a subspace you have fewer components so what you end up with will be a tor matrix as the basis uh, uh, matrix that is tor but it's full rank each column is linearly independent and again using the the same idea of inverse in, but in this case left inverse you can do the basis transformation now the test for vectors to be orthogonal would be the inner product equal to zero orthogonality by which i actually mean orthonormality uh, of matrices inverse is, is equal to transpose then we did gram smith is a successive orthogonalization of uh, columns of a matrix so it's column operations not elementary row operations but elementary column operations resulting in a equal to qr decomposition r is an upper triangular matrix q is an orthogonal matrix orthonormal matrix okay and then we looked at uh, the rotation matrices just for the heck of it not really very useful in computer science but maybe somewhere okay in r2 you need only one angle but in r3 you need three angles in r4 maybe you want to think about it or investigate how many angles you need my guess is that it's probably going to be six but i'm not sure 